we've got a fantastic show for you today. We're going to talk about central bank digital currencies, the digital dollar, the cryptocurrency that will inevitably win the game. Why? Well, because it is backed by the largest military complex the human race has ever known. And uh, that is the digital dollar. That's the CBDC, the central bank digital currency, Fed coin. Call it whatever you want. These are all little variations of the same concept. <laughs> there will be multiple layers to this, though. When it happens, there will be a, a commercial or sort of a wholesale version of it, a retail version of it. It will be rolled out. It is inevitable. I mean, it's it's interesting because if you're watching me on video and you see what's on the screen here, you see our guest today that we'll get to in just a moment, Clive Thompson. He's a retired wealth manager with some really, really fascinating, deep knowledge of this topic. And we're going to talk about the economy in general and where the markets are going, but we're also going to have a focus on this surveillance state in which we already live in, but we are galloping toward uh, a much more significant surveillance state. And when this happens, it may become something that is basically irreversible. So we all had better be on guard to protect our liberties to whatever extent we can, because things are changing very, very quickly. And with the recent rise in popularity, and thank God the world's paying attention to this, it was already happening behind the scenes, but as of November 30th of last year, OpenAI launching ChatGPT really made the whole world pay attention to this. And it is going to give the powers that be a degree of control and a massive opportunity to snoop into every aspect of our lives. You know, I remember back in the year 2000, okay? So this is almost a quarter of a century ago. I remember at my real estate office in Orange County, California, one of my offices there, we used to have an office meeting every Tuesday, right? And Tuesday at noon, we'd have the office meeting. And this particular Tuesday, I got up and I gave a speech about a program, a piece of hardware and, and a government program. I don't, well, it was called Carnivore. And you could probably look this up and learn about it a little bit, but the government wanted to install these carnivore devices. They were basically probably rack mounted computer systems that they would install in the big internet companies, the ISPs at the, at the time, AOL, <laughs> Google, you know, and the others at the time, they wanted to install the carnivore program and the device to monitor communications on the internet. And people at the time, were up in arms over this. They were really concerned. Privacy advocates were really, really concerned about this. I was too. And then, wouldn't you know it, either by chance or by complicity or by plan, 9-11 happened the following year. And the whole discussion of opposing carnivore went completely out the window to where we moved into a surveillance world that we just had never seen before and the patriot act came about and all of the banking regulations and all of this stuff and, and listen i'm not saying that all of that is bad i don't think that but i am saying that what usually happens with these things is they decay into a thing that once it was used for this idea of you know stop the bad guys right but it decays into a way to stop the good guys Certainly, I've noticed in the banking world, I mean, it is such a monumental hassle to do banking anymore. I spend so much time every single week in my different companies dealing with like banking. You know, before years ago, banking was invisible to me. It was just like this thing in the background, you know, but nowadays it's like you need a department to manage banking. I, I, it's just unbelievable how things have become such a hassle. We all know what a hassle it is to board an airplane anymore, right? So, you know, these things degrade and, and they never really seem to work in, in stopping the bad guys very well. I mean, I guess they work a little bit around the margins, but mostly they just impinge upon the freedoms of ordinary good people, right? And that, that's what happens. That's what will happen with the CBDC. And this is a massive weapon that really could be as I predicted almost 25 years ago, checkmate 
on the human race. Now, I didn't predict it back then as a central bank digital currency or even a digital currency. I was just saying back then, and look, you can go back and listen to my old episodes, but you won't get that far back because I didn't have a podcast back in, you know, 25 years ago. But, you know, you you can see that I was thinking about this for many years before that, when, when I started doing the podcast, and even my old radio show before the podcast, you can, you can listen to me talk about this stuff. Those recordings have been replayed on the podcast before we even had what we call Flashback Friday, okay? And I said back then that if ever they create a global fiat currency that will be checkmate on the human race because they will just have such control over everybody the control to make you rich or poor almost instantly through inflation or deflation to control certain people and others and what you buy and it's just unbelievably scary but now you add to that the power of a digital system. And it just, it's like an order of magnitude more powerful for the elites. So we're gonna talk about that today, plus the economy in general. And I think you'll really be fascinated by this. But this page, this screenshot from the Federal Reserve's own website, it's, it's interesting. It says, while the Federal Reserve has made no decisions on whether to pursue or implement central bank digital currency or CBDC, we have been exploring the potential benefits and risk of CBDCs from a variety of angles, including through technological research and experimentation. Our key focus is on whether this, how, uh, on whether and how a CBDC could improve on an already safe and efficient U.S. domestic payment system. Well, folks, this is just a complete lie. I mean, they have made the decision. They cannot not do this. They have to do this, okay? Even if they just totally cherished all of us having lots of freedom and control over our lives and lots of privacy by using cash, right? Even if they believed that, which of course they don't, but if they did, they still have to do this. It just makes too much sense for them not to have a digital version of their currency. Of course they will, and many other countries are way ahead of the US. They're already doing this. It'll be linked to social scoring. I mean, it's just so, so treacherous what's coming. So be on guard, listen to this interview. You're really gonna like it. Okay, before we get to that, you know, this again is the big decision, right? Runaway inflation or banking system collapse. Well, it's not exactly that, of course, because, and as I say, they always vote for inflation. That's always where it goes. It's always their answer because number one, it hurts them the least and helps them the most. And when I say them, I mean the government, the central banks, the elite class, the Cantillon effect, all of that idea of those people and institutions who are closest to the money printer they benefit the most. Goldman Sachs, I mean, Goldman Sachs. Oh no, let's call them Goldman Sachs because that's what they really are. They benefit, you know, all the banksters, the Wall Street class, the elite class, the rich. Look, I benefit, okay? I just philosophically hate it, okay? And that's why I rail against it so much against this kind of policy of inflation. And look, I don't need the money. You know, I've already made my money. I'm, I'm done, okay? I, I'm just here because I want to get the word out about this stuff. It is just a way that they are just shaping the world and impoverishing billions and billions of people. And I think it's evil. So how did they vote for inflation? Well, last week, you might think they voted against inflation because they did raise the rate again, which, as I said before, that kind of shocked me that they didn't do an about face. A lot of people predict they will within about two to three months, they're going to do an about face and start lowering rates. We'll see. It's anybody's guess. I don't know. Look, nobody knows, right? This is the problem with a centrally planned economy. You're subject to all sorts of political influences and things that don't necessarily make sense. But they did vote for inflation last week because of the lending facility they set up to backstop the banks. And now that they're back going into the business, I'm sure it will be in a very heavy way of buying up assets again. Remember, during the COVID era, the Federal Reserve was the biggest investor on planet Earth, right? An investor. They will do a lot more investing to backstop the system. And that's inflationary. 
And so is having a $2 trillion lending facility. That's inflationary. This is all inflationary. You don't have to do QE in the way that it's been done before. You don't have to do money printing in the way that it's done before. There are lots of different ways and lots of different levers they can pull to make this happen. But that's why inflation-induced debt destruction is more important than ever. Because if you think you've seen inflation in the United States, let me tell you you ain't seen nothing yet. It is going to get much more severe, much more significant. Now, if in six months, we have a disinflationary cycle or a deflationary cycle, don't start writing comments that Jason was wrong. I'm talking about the macro big picture. And I am going to be right about this. There will be little spats of this and that. But you know, I'm not a trader. I don't trade. I'm not that style of investor. I'm the type of investor, you just buy stuff and you hold on to it. You trade it a little bit here and there, but I don't wake up and check the stock quotes and trade things, okay? I don't check, you know, what is the economic news today? What's the unemployment rate? Oh, I better trade this or that. You know, I, I don't do that. I'm an investor. I just get in and I generally move very slowly. And I think that's really being an investor, not a speculator. You already know what I think about that. But inflation-induced debt destruction is going to be such a powerful wealth creator going forward. It already has been an incredibly powerful wealth creator for the last five decades, but it's going to be much, much more significant and much more important going forward. It is going to be your ace in the hole. Now, that's not going to last forever. As I've talked about, in 20 years, maybe a little more than 20 years, we are on the verge of a real change in population, a demographic cliff. And that's when things are going to change. But that's a long way off. And we will be on episode 14,938 when I talk about that one. Okay, this is only episode 1978. So we got a while before we're going to be talking about that. I don't know. If we publish three per week, would that be 14,900? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, you can do the math and, and write your comment below and let me know. Okay, so this is an interesting article. This is from the Wall Street Journal. I just wanted to share a couple things with you before we get to our guest. So, 3 million U.S. households making $150,000 a year or more, remember, that's almost triple the typical household income, right, are still renters. These people are renting. Now, you know what I think about this from listening for a long, long time. I think it's just fine to rent your house. In fact, I wish I was a renter now. My house is for sale and it sold and then it fell through and now I got to do it all over again. And someone came over to show it this morning. We had to clean up, right? It's a real hassle to do this. I do think you should own a lot of rental properties. So you're in the game, of course, because it's the most historically proven asset class in the world. But when it comes to your personal residence, especially if it's an expensive home, you're almost always better to rent it than you are to own it because that rent to value ratio is so much favorable for you as the tenant than it is for the renter, right? It's favorable to you as the tenant to have a high-end property that you rent and have a lot of low-end properties or entry-level properties that you rent to other people. That's what I meant to say. But look at this, 154%, the increase in renter households making $150,000 or more a year in Austin, Texas, according to five-year estimates from the U.S. Census Bureau. This is truly amazing that these people with the means to easily buy a home are renting, you know, variety of reasons, variety of circumstances. I think a lot of it is because of the COVID era. And of course, I predicted all of that stuff and it came exactly true the first time that first segment of lockdowns kind of pulled back and a lot of people became free again. They started to move immediately to the suburban markets. And what did they do? You know, a lot of times they rented initially before they bought something because they wanted to see how much they like it. So this is pretty darn amazing stuff, really, that there are so many renters and there are so few sellers and inventory is in such low supply. You've seen this chart. I've shown it to you many times, but they've got all these cheap mortgages that they're just not willing to give up. Now, I showed you this chart of inventory last week that inventory still falling a little bit. 
only about just under 40% of the amount of inventory that anybody would consider normal. So people are hanging onto their houses, they're not selling them. But this chart is a new one, okay? And this is really interesting because what this shows you is the listing supply or the supply of housing inventory over the course of a year, right? And, and we touched on this one before, but just look at how it usually increases usually increases. You see that arc up as you get into the Jason era, you know, July, August, September, October, November, but it's very, very low right now. Now, this also we talked about, and this is the million dollar cities that we've lost, right? We've lost a lot of million dollar cities because those high priced homes in the cyclical markets going down. Again, you know, this is just review for you regular people, but I can't emphasize it enough how important it is because this gives you the basis to understand what different markets are gonna do. Are they linear? Are they cyclical? Are they hybrid? Do their appreciation charts look slow and steady like Memphis or Indianapolis? Or do they look like a roller coaster like Los Angeles, California? That is so important to understand that because it's exactly as I predicted it would be. It is happening now, just as I have been saying it's going to happen for the last few years. Those cyclical markets suffering, declining, inventory increasing more so than in the linear markets, and those prices softening more. Linear markets, not so much. Much safer bet for people who are real investors and not traders. Now, I also announced last week, I did actually a special super quick live stream. You probably didn't catch it. It was very impromptu that we have a very unique opportunity and we're doing a Zoom meeting on it this week. 100% financing for investors. Yeah, you heard that right. 100% financing for investors, nothing down. Take advantage of this. Join us for this Zoom meeting. It's on Thursday, noon Pacific, three o'clock Eastern. Just go and register at jasonhartman.com slash join. That's jasonhartman.com slash join. And join us for this Zoom meeting. It's going to be really good. I think we're well over 200 people have registered already. So this is really, really going to be good. It only applies to our Alabama and Florida properties in our network, 100% financing. They will only allow five loans for each investor. And you have to do this in your personal name, no LLCs which actually makes it a little bit easier. A lot of these uh, sort of specialized lenders, this is a very specialized deal. We haven't seen this in many years, this type of offer, but a lot of them require you to set up an LLC and they make it a business loan. This is not a business loan. It's a personal, you know, normal like mortgage, a normal mortgage loan in your personal name, but you're limited to five of them. You can only do five. And for practical purposes, we have had already so much demand and so much interest in this. As usual, this lender will probably become inundated with loan applications very quickly right after our Thursday Zoom meeting. It's gonna be crazy. I just know it by the response already. So make sure you're there so you can take advantage if you're interested in investing in Florida or Alabama. I think you'll really like this. 100% financing, no money down, jasonhartman.com slash join. Okay, let's get to our guest. Let's talk about CBDCs and talk to Clive Thompson. You're really going to be interested in this, not just CBDCs, but the economy and the outlook in general. So here we go. It is my pleasure to welcome Clive Thompson to the show. He is a retired wealth manager in Geneva, Switzerland, and it's great to have him on. I heard him recently talking on another show about CBDCs, central bank digital currencies. And I have talked many times before, as you know, about how I think this is the possible checkmate against the human race, <laughs> quite literally, because of the amount of control and data harvesting that will be available to the elite class and having us use these CBDCs. So we'll, we'll talk about that and some other topics as well. Clive, welcome. How are you? No, well, thank you very much. It's a late evening here, and it's a very cold uh, winter here in Geneva. It's about minus six outside, and we've got frost on the ground. Yeah, <laughs> well, good stuff. But it is pretty, I will say that, right? <laughs> 
let's start off with the the topic of central bank digital currencies. And, you know, one of the things I used to always talk about with one of our doctor clients years ago when I was in Newport Beach, California, is if we ever got to the point where there was a global fiat currency, this was long before Bitcoin, we we didn't think about digital and crypto back then, we always said this would be checkmate because they could simply because they'd control the value of that currency and there would be no place to run if there was one single global currency. But now with the advent of cryptocurrencies, the level of control that is possible is truly horrifying. And this is a digital currency, so it could be geo-programmed where it would only work within a mile of your home they wanted you to stay in your neighborhood. It would only work during certain times of day if there was a curfew. It could be inflated and deflated depending on maybe your social credit score. What kind of products can you buy? If if they don't like what you're posting on social media, maybe you can't buy an internet access account with it. You know, there are all kinds of truly scary Orwellian levels of control here available. Am I being too paranoid uh, with my tinfoil hat on here, or is that realistic? Uh, Well, well, you said a lot of things I hadn't thought of, but I can think of a lot of things you didn't say as well. Sure. Uh, Well, tell me what I didn't say, too. Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, I can imagine that the government might at some point need an emergency tax, uh, and they'll cancel every cent beginning with the or ending with the letter E, for example, they will be able to adjust the interest rate that you earn on your digital dollars, uh, higher or lower instantaneously to encourage your behavior. They can make your currency expire if you don't spend it. Uh, For example, they might, uh, they could issue everybody with a universal basic income, a UBI, if that's convenient for the government. And as you say, they'll be able to know everything you do with your money. Yeah. And they'll be able to trace the movement of every single cent and see where it went. So it'll also be a tool for taxation uh, because they'll be able to see what sort of cash flow is passing through you or through your wallet or through your through your yep. business and determine if that corresponds to what's going on in your tax return. Yeah, that's it's it's truly scary. I mean, if if they want to create inflation or deflation, they can control the velocity of money by making it expire or. Yeah just inflating or deflating the value, changing your spending behavior like they do now, but to a much slower degree, this would just give them a a massive amount of control. I mean, this is pretty much inevitable, isn't it? Well, there's more than 100 companies working on the digital countries. So it's countries, yeah. So it's going to come all over the place. Right. So it is inevitable. And I think to start with, it'll be fairly benign. Um, all the negatives we've just been talking about, perhaps we won't see them in the early stages, but little by little, they'll add these controls one by one, they'll yep. add the spying one by one until pretty much we're in the same sort of controlled society. We are to some extent already when we go on to the social media apps, uh, because let's face it, you find yourself talking about something in your home, then you go on to uh, YouTube or Google, you find an ad pops up, which seems to correspond with something you were talking about 10 minutes ago. So we we know uh, now, is that coincidence or did you search for it the week before? But anyway, somehow they know what they think you're interested in. And that's just going to get more and uh, and deeper and deeper. And it won't just be the big corporations, it'll be the government as well. That's true. I think you said before 105 countries are working on this. Is it just a control thing? Or, I mean, you could argue if you wanted to think it was maybe more benign, look, this will be a cost savings for the country because running a mint and printing a physical currency, especially coins, is super expensive for them, right? So much easier to do it digitally, isn't it? Much less expensive? I see it more as a convenience for the central bank in the way they can control the economy. They'll have a much faster and more powerful control over the economy when the digital currency is widely adopted. And and perhaps I should just say, I don't think we'll suddenly wake up one morning and find we've got to use the digital currency. I think it will be a, a, a gradual approach. We'll have the digital currency running alongside our existing money, but gradually, uh, simply through convenience, people will use more and more of the digital currency. The money will 
sort of fade away into disuse and ultimately they'll say look there's no point in having money anymore it'd be a bit like sweden where you can't actually no spend cash. your money anymore because yeah. uh, although it's legal tender nobody wants it right right last time i was in sweden i saw a lot of stores said no cash accepted you know they they only take credit cards or payment systems like apple pay and google pay and i'm seeing that in the us now too you know three interesting things that i saw during the covid era Number one, I remember seeing articles right at the beginning of it of how they thought the virus was being transferred on currency, right? So everyone was scared to touch the, the currency, right? Because those bills and those coins mm -hmm. had the germs on them, right? So that was one thing they did. And then I noticed all of these retailers, they didn't have any coins. They didn't have any change. There was this massive shortage of change. They could not give you change. Yeah, it's, uh, it's so we saw that everywhere. I mean, yeah. all the retailers, if if they they either said no cash or they said, please use the digital terminal, the, mm -hmm. the your credit card. But of course, we're back to using cash a lot at the moment. Uh, but obviously, once the digital currency comes in, I think it'll start by being used a little by some people, and, and it'll gradually get more and more used. Just like we got to use used to using credit cards, and don't forget. Visa and MasterCard and know exactly what we're doing with our money when we use yeah. their cards. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything we can do to fight back to protect ourselves? Well, I think you've got to be prepared to have some alternative way of spending um, so that when you go to the fortune teller and she says, cross my palm with silver, uh, you can cross her palm with silver. Or if you want to buy your wife a birthday present and you don't want her to know how much you spent on it, you need to perhaps think about ways you might be able to uh, pay the merchant uh, if you'll accept whatever you have. Um, but, you know, to my mind, uh, silver coins might might have a role. Maybe a cryptocurrency, which is outside the realm of the government, might have a role. And we'll have to see how it pans out because it depends on what the demand is like for that. Yeah, right. I just wonder if we'll be able to spend it. What about other cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin? Are they going to crack down on that? I mean, I've long thought that the problem with, with Bitcoin and any other crypto is they don't have standing armies, they don't have police forces, and governments can just make them illegal if they, if they really are threatened by the, the competition from these alternatives. What, what do you think? Well, they've made a lot of things illegal, and they're still out there. Sure. Um, so I think uh, whatever happens, Bitcoin will always always be there. Um, the question is whether it will acquire more value. And we mustn't forget, there's certainly going to be quite a few politicians who earn Bitcoin themselves. Right. Uh, so there might be a little bit of vested interest in that. I'm but, so glad you, know, you made that point, Clive, because one of my Bitcoin maximalist friends says that to me all the time. He says, Jason, what you have to realize is the government is not, you know, some single entity, right? There, there are a whole bunch of people in government that are fans of Bitcoin that own it themselves and they don't want to, you know, they're going to act out of their self-interest, obviously. So go ahead. And I think some of the largest corporations in the uh, in the world, maybe not uh, investment corporations, maybe not in the last three months, uh, but stepping back to the early part of 2022, were starting to give their clients access to Bitcoin type products, funds and ETFs and things like that, which own Bitcoin. Uh, I think they've pulled back a lot because of the recent events regarding a lot of bankruptcies in the crypto space. Uh, but it's, you know, Bitcoin is not going to go away. Um, I'm not uh, promoting it as a super investment because I don't know if it's going to go to a million dollars and I don't know if it's going to go to zero. I I think the zero is an unlikely scenario, but it there is a danger it could wither away if the if it becomes more and more difficult to onboard and offboard your money from Bitcoin. Um, but on the other hand, there's a huge army of wealthy people who say, I have to be diversified across a lot of assets. And there's no doubting that as of today, it is an asset and it is also a legal asset. You could legally own it. So why wouldn't uh, a wealthy family have 1% or 2% of their assets exposed to that as well as everything else they can lay their hands on? Yeah, couldn't agree more. What is your view of, of the future in terms of inflation, deflation, stagnation, or stagflation, maybe is the better word? Yeah. Uh, my origins are in the UK, where the inflation rate has been somewhat higher than the USA. 
so certainly in the early 70s, so all, all the way through the 70s and early 80s, we had very high inflation. I did come across a letter I'd written to my boss uh, back in the mid, mid-70s, mid uh, uh, late 70s, actually, uh, in which I was protesting that my 29% pay rise was barely keeping up with inflation, which I think wow. was running at 29% at the time. Wow, and, that's uh, amazing. What year is this? Uh, that would have been something like 1979. Unbelievable. The 29% inflation. That's just, just hard I mean, to it did, it did It did come down rapidly. That would have been about the peak. But it was a very, very high. Um, I recently did a study on how much gold you could buy with £10,000 sterling. Um, back in 1971, you could buy 635 ounces of gold. By 2000, which was 29 years later, you could only buy one tenth of that. You could buy 63 and a half ounces of gold. And today, with 10,000 pounds, you could only buy one tenth of that, which is 1% of the original amount, uh, which is 6.3 ounces of gold. So it's the value of the pound which has gone down. Right. Even though one could argue the price of gold went up, but really it's the money going down. And the same thing would apply if you look at how much gold you could have bought with $10,000, the amount you could have bought with it has gone down. And the same applies to anything else you could have bought with pounds, dollars, euros, or yen or any other currency, property, you name it. Anything which is tangible and valuable and in limited supply, the price has tended over the decades to go up because there's more and more money on the planet being printed all the time and people have to deploy their cash into assets. So if you're a wealthy billionaire, you're going to buy a Van Gogh and you're going to be able to pay more than the last guy could pay because there's more money on the planet. Yeah, right. I know. And that's why one of the many reasons the rich love art, because it is a high value density and a high degree of portability. And, you know, the art market is largely a scam too, <laughs> because because of the way things are valued, but that's another discussion. So back to hard assets, things that have intrinsic value. I always say, Clive, there are two things that drive the value for anything, scarcity and utility. You can't just have scarcity alone though. You gotta have utility, right? And of course, you know, if we listen to someone like Alan Greenspan, he would say gold is a barbarous relic, <laughs> right? You've heard that. Uh, yes, yes. Does gold really have much utility though in today's world? The central banks uh, of Russia, China, India, and other places are acquiring gold as if there's no tomorrow and yep. acquiring it rapidly. And the reason they're doing that is they can see that the end of the currency we have, the fiat system, is getting closer. And when the world has to reset itself and start again, there's a chance it will need to be backed by something tangible like gold, as it used to be. And if you have a lot of gold, you're going to get a seat at the table when this is when it's negotiated how the new system will work. And yeah. you have the most gold, you'll probably be calling the shots. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of desire from the central banks to earn gold because they realize that if a reset is needed, it might be necessary to back it by gold. Now, it's not necessarily what will happen, but it's a it's a it's a plan, uh, you know, plan A or plan B that they've got. That if necessary, they've got something tangible to back their currency and trade take, with. Take us through the mechanics of what is a currency reset and how would that actually work? I mean, of course, it would need to be coordinated with other governments for their currencies at the same time. I mean, if one country does it alone, that's not going to work very well. And and one of the things, by the way, that's been scary to me is a lot of this rhetoric from Janet Yellen about cutting off the tax havens. And, you know, really, I mean, these governments, this is like a free market. It's a competition. Like, we're going to make our laws more desirable. So come and set up a business here. Bring your money here. Bring your money to our banks, right? And I think that's a good thing. You know, that's that's just like a marketplace of stores or any other businesses, right? And governments should be that way so people can vote with their feet. But Yellen wants to really put a stop to that. I have never heard so much rhetoric out of a Treasury Secretary or former Federal Reserve Chair, obviously. But what is a currency reset? How does that work? How does it really play out? Take us through that. There have been countless currency resets historically all around the world and in all kinds of ways. But as a general rule, the population loses its trust in the old currency. It's been debased or it's, there's just too much of it and it can't buy anything and people are rushing to change their old currency into anything they can. 
that's generally the moment when it becomes unavoidable. So when the currency reset happens, they'll let you change some of your money into the new currency, but not all of your money. As a general rule, things like salaries are by law or edict converted over to the new, new currency. You'll see that shop prices are in the new currency. Taxes are going to be in the new currency. Most likely, rents will by, will by law be converted to the new currency. But all kinds of monetary assets, and that would include bonds or mortgages, will stay behind in the old currency. There'd be no point in converting them all over to the new currency, otherwise you've achieved nothing. It just changed one old dollar for 100 old cents. It's the same thing. So when you have a new currency, you've got to have less of it, and you've got to bottleneck or throttle the big holders of the currency to stop them deploying that currency and disrupting the economy. Very interesting. So through the legal tender laws in the given country, US, European countries, you know, all over, they would require that rents, salaries, and stores, Just, retail be yep. traded in the new currency, right? So they would yep. say, well, the dollar is no more, now it's the Amero, <laughs> right? There was that, you know, a lot of talk about that before Bitcoin. I go back a long way as, as you do. And so that would be the required currency, right? But why would they leave mortgages and bonds behind? I mean, you said they wouldn't want to reset those, right? So mortgage holders, I mean, I love this because many have said they would reset the mortgages too. And you don't know this, but one of the strategies I've been teaching for 18 years, I actually trademarked it because it, it became something of great interest to my audience, is called inflation-induced debt destruction. And so that strategy is buy assets that are indexed to inflation, like houses, because they're made of materials, copper wire, petroleum products, lumber, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? Glass, steel, and all those commodities, and then finance them with long-term cheap debt, as cheap as you can get it, and let inflation pay that mortgage off for you, as well as, of course, your, your tenants, your renters. And that's a great strategy. But those who think there's a reset coming sometimes argue and say, well, Jason, they'll just reset everything. They'll reset the mortgages, they'll reset the salaries, the retail, the everything will be reset at the same time. But you're saying they wouldn't reset the mortgages or the bonds. Now, the mortgage holders would be benefiting hugely from that, I think. And the bond holders would be hurt dramatically from that, I, I think also, right? Tell us about that. Historically, when a currency is reset, those who old own debt instruments, which means a deposit in the bank or a bond or somebody who owes you money, are owed money in the old currency. It doesn't generally get converted over. There would be no point in converting everything over because if they converted everything over, it's just changing A for B, which is the same, and it's still the same thing. You have a currency reset when thing, the currency has got out of control, when there's a complete distrust in the old currency. So to have trust in the new currency, you have to have a new system, and you they'll only allow a changeover of some of the money. So if you are relatively poor, uh, and uh, the man in the street, 90% of the population, you'll probably have no particular problem that $500 or $1,000 or even $5,000 you've got in the bank will be converted over one for one, and you'll be as happy as a lark. In fact, you'll be even happier because your mortgage is left behind in the old currency. Now, on the other side of your mortgage, there's going to be a bondholder somewhere. He's not going to be too happy because he's right. the bondholder, but then, but then he's the the guy who's super rich, who will have lots of other assets, and he'll be very disappointed about the fiat type assets he's got, but he won't be so disappointed about the other assets, which have managed to survive the currency reset. He'll say, what a smart cookie I was to have all these other assets like property, which survived the reset. And there will be, when we have a reset, there will be bailouts for pension funds, because the pension funds own a lot of bonds. And they can't leave the pensioners um, suffering. Now, it may, may not be a one-for-one -one bailout for the pension plans, but certainly they'll look after the pensioners. Perhaps with a, uh, you know, the first twenty or thirty thousand of your income will be fine. But if you're getting a, a million a year in pension payments, maybe only part of it will be covered. But historically, uh, when we've had these currency resets, the assets and liabilities denominated in fiat money 
do not get converted or only partially get converted or only get converted under certain circumstances. So I just want to touch on something you said about mortgage hold, uh, people who've taken out mortgage to buy property. Sure. I think if you bought a house and took out your mortgage five years ago, you'll be just fine. In fact, you'll be laughing all the way to the bank because your mortgage is in a, a defunct currency, which is withering away. I think that if you take it out a mortgage in the three months prior to the reset, people will see it that you've been gaming the system. And they're not going to like you very much for that because they missed out on the chance to game the system. The newspapers aren't going to like you. And the government is going to think, try and get its pound of flesh. So I can see some sort of windfall tax because some people will have been in the right place and the right time. And they will say, you know, you made a ton of money by perhaps borrowing a ton of money before the reset and buying some assets, tangible assets. Perhaps we'll have a pound of flesh off you. So, yeah, no, I, I mean, uh, that's interesting. It's, about pos- the it's possible. Yeah, the, the, that's very interesting about the windfall tax. And I think you're right. People would certainly be envious, no question. However, in the midst of a currency reset, lawmakers and administrators, they're going to be awfully busy. <laughs> I can't imagine they would be have yeah. time to worry about the, this small number of people who got a mortgage three months before the reset happened, especially when people, you know, I'm sure they would keep this secret like the Berlin Wall, right? They're, they're not going to tell announce the reset because then everybody will have time to act. You know, that's why the Fed has so much secrecy around it. And interestingly, Powell isn't that secretive, but Greenspan sure was. You know? So, yeah, they, I, I mean, it's certainly it possible. And in principle, you're right. Yeah. I just don't think they would have the time or the inclination or the ability to pull it off. 